Discussion, um, sorry, we're going to continue our two-part discussion of paganism today, <laughs> paganism anyway. Um, just FYI, Clat, we're not meeting on Monday. Just keep an eye on that. Okay, we're not meeting again until Wednesday. Cool. All right. Awesome. First things first. What are some common forms of pagan worship? I asked Carson. Right there. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> oh, you called them, man. I, I did. Um, <laughs> Some common um, forms of pagan worship. So they like the Olympics were started. Like that's one of the examples. Oh, so we we've all met the Olympics, right? And it's originally a, a, a commemoration of Zeus and Olympia. And um, like an example of like what you got out of it is like there was a guy who went in a chef, I think it was. Yes. And he came out a demigod. Yeah, as one does, right? Yeah. So he went to go. Uh, he was a really good uh, sportsman, so much that they made him immortal. Isn't that um, nice? There were also public events like parades or. Um, Okay, you so can go to. I'm sorry, you can go to temples or a parade is sort of the temple in reverse, right? Yeah. What happens? Um, they pray down the street and then like sometimes the god will be there and they'll come and like see the people and then you can praise them there. Um, how, but, how is the god present? I mean, it's not just like, you know, a transcendent being doesn't show up. When you say the god is there, what do you mean the god is there? Like. What are they parading? I can't really remember, but I think it's like like a local god comes down? Sure, the gods are always local, right? Yeah. Except for so like, God, but... So like people who say they're related to the god come down and... Uh, not exactly. Um, did you catch it? Yeah. Um, I think there's like a, there's a, like a idol. Or An idol. A piece of art that they uh -huh. like yeah. around. Yeah, an idol. It's actually, yeah, so there's usually some sort of form of the god a statue, an image, an object that somehow symbolizes the god. Uh, if you want to be really anthropological about it, we call it a totem, maybe, you know. All right. Oh, what else? Um, and then you go visit the gods, um, and that's like where you can go to the temple. Okay, yeah. Um, and there were different parts of the temple. There was like a part for the clergy, which I don't know. I don't remember what that was called. The sort of inner and outer sections <laughs> yeah. of temples, yeah. And then there was another part where like sacrifices and offerings would be made to the god. And then there was like a, kind of a common place outside that temple. Okay, cool. So besides going to temples and parades, which by the way, the parades in the ancient world were the bomb, because that's probably if you were a commoner, which most people would have been of some kind, um, there's no middle class in the ancient world. Um, it's probably the only time of the year that you can get to eat meat, because before refrigeration, you don't really eat meat unless there's a reason why hundreds of people are going to eat a dead animal that day. So the sacrifice to the gods is a rare time where you, common people, have the ability to eat meat, which is sacrifice to a god. Okay? Any other kinds of unusual um, worship, maybe? Or maybe not unusual, but... There is a poem contest. Poetry contests! Yeah. Yeah, all right. And, by the way, if you ever look at ancient poems, they always begin with an invocation of the gods, usually a goddess, usually a muse. What do we call it today when you invoke a muse? Uh, not just that. What do we call it? A kind of poetry where you invoke a muse. It's a rhymed kind of poetry, usually with an instrumentation that's invoking a muse. Music! We call it music. Yes. All right, cool. Uh, so notice that these things are not off the event, right? We've, we, we, we have all these things in our own culture now. We have sporting events. We have theaters. We have temples of some sort that don't really function the same way. But we certainly have parades, right? Um, we have uh, poetry contests and poetry generally. We have music, right? And we have theater. These are things that are not foreign to us because we inherited these from these ancient people. Okay? Thank you very much. Bless you. Next up, we have some definitions. We have myth, mystery, ecstasy, and mysticism. All right. Next up, uh, Chris A. Come back and get you. Yes. All right. Uh, Hannah D. Hannah D. Nope. Uh, what's this? Seven? Is that right? I know. You got this? I think so. All right, guy. Let's go. So first up, we have the word myth. Um, so myth is when, uh, by an ancient definition, yeah. or how an ancient a narrative of something to, to 
like shut away uh, from normal understanding. It shows what you can't see. Either. Okay. It's yeah. what you can't talk about. Uh, it's a narrative of the transcendent. They use it. Or they, yeah, they say it like stories and songs to explain it. Okay. This is just, it's very, so the word, you're exactly right. The word myth, actually three of these words, myth, mystery, and mysticism, are all from the same word in Muthay, which means to shut or close off something in Greek. Um, FYI, the way we use the word myth today, meaning a common misconception or a story that is commonly known to be true or is unfortunately not known enough to be true, that is not what we're talking about here at all. Uh, generally, when we say myth like that, we mean what? Like something that, oh, um, people used to say that the earth was flat, but that's actually not true. Ancient people knew damn well the earth was round. That's a common <laughs> myth, a misconception. Right? People don't really think that way. Um, and this means just the opposite. Right? This is, when you talk about ancient myths here, these are stories that are by definition true. Okay? There's something that exposed something that's hidden, muthe, right? Mystery from you. Speaking of mystery, what's a mystery? Uh, it's a truth that must be experienced or reflected upon. You quoted my words very well, thank you. Um, those of you who maybe go to, let's say, high church type Christian traditions, Catholics, Episcopalians, Eastern Orthodox, you hear about mysteries from time to time, okay? In that context, what's a mystery? You say, let's say you go to a Catholic church and there's a priest in front of you and he says, we are going to discuss the mystery of the virgin birth. Does that mean you're gonna to try to solve it? I'm going to try to figure it out. We're going to solve the mystery. Right. So what does it mean in this context, the mystery of the virgin birth? Yeah? Kind of like referring to like the transcendence. Yeah, it refers to something you can't experience or see head on, right? And so you're going to have an experience of it. So usually when a modern Christian in these cases uses it, they're talking about having a meditation or a prayerful reflection of something, right? We're going to, we're going to focus in on this thing that exposes the muthe, the hidden thing, right? Okay, uh, uh, ecstasy, please. Uh, so ecstasy is to stand outside yourself uh, or doing something that's outside yourself for a moment, uh, like experiencing the transit. Okay, could you elaborate on what you think that means? Um, so if you're doing like a ritual or something, uh, it's kind of like experiencing emotion. It's not like, I don't know, but it's, 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 it's a feeling. It's not something you can like speak or yeah but, okay but you, you understand it for a moment. How about this? Back to the, um, now. I'm thinking about high church Christians and mysteries and stuff. Um, those of you, have you ever gone especially to a very well made sort of old fashioned Christian church, like a cathedral or something like that? Um, when you walk in, every one of your senses gets completely like rearranged. So you walk in and you're going to see light in ways that you don't normally see light through candles, lamps, and stained glass. You're going to taste foods or not foods, perhaps anyone who you ask. You're going to taste things that you don't normally taste. You're going to smell things you don't normally smell, like incense, right? You're going to hear things you don't normally hear, including things in dead languages, right? It's literally making you stand outside of your normal experience, right? It's an experience that pulls you out of your normal world, okay? Got it? Cool. All right, and finally, mysticism, please. Uh, I had the art of seeking out direct experience of mystery. Uh, and you can do that by having a theopathy, uh, practicing yoga, meditation, and uh, if you were from ancient Greece, you would do the illusion of rituals. Yeah, which are called mysteries, right? Yeah. All same root word, again, how do you see hidden things, Muthe, right? Well, in this case, it's an act you deliberately do to experience or see hidden things, right? And we met the example of yoga, we met that one before. Um, and then, of course, in the Greek mysteries, where is it? you're gonna go experience the cult of a god, not just know about it. I mean, obviously, you know about the gods already, right? You're gonna go experience them. You're gonna, get, you're gonna go stand outside of your normal experience and have a direct experience of your gods or your hidden realities. Thank you very much. Did I write that down? I did not see that. And next up, every once in a while, even though the gods are local, the gods are local, the gods are local, but every once in a while, um, 
a local god becomes a god of everything. And by the way, I don't mean a unique god, like there's only one of them, not necessarily. I mean a god who has power everywhere. There could still be other gods. It just means this one god is not local anymore. Okay? So how do local gods become gods of everything? Uh, next person up. And is Ellie at Ellie N. Hi, Ellie. Hi. You got it? all over the old Roman world. And she's an Egyptian goddess originally, that's her locality. But she never stops, she never becomes like an everything goddess. She just, she remains a fertility goddess, but who had lots of jurisdiction, whose jurisdiction is wider. But you're on the right track. We have, um, you have empire, empires are the key bit. Remember that the gods are local, the gods are local, the gods are local, okay? So the reason why the gods are local is because imminent phenomena, what's the world around us is local, right? Generally speaking, you don't run into the transcendent or the universal. So you would imagine if people had to explain the powers behind the world, they would explain it as things you could see and touch, right? Not the god of the universe, that's too big. It was, oh, the god of that forest, right? The goddess of that stream, right? So what happens in a political unit like an empire? You have one power that now has authority in lots of places. So, for instance, imagine you're in 3,000 years ago in Lydia, Northern Africa, and you believe in a god called Reggie. And Reggie the god uh, is your local god. He lives in a fountain over there. He gives your people water, and he's pretty nice. And then someone says, you know, there's a faraway place uh, called Gaul, call it France today. And they have other gods there, not like Reggie. And if you're an ancient pagan, you go, yep, yeah, they do. And those might be other gods, that could be your god under a different name, so far as, you know. Um, and then what happens, the Roman Empire shows up. And now, you're here, and you know that those people in Gaul still exist, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. You've never been there, you've never heard of their people, you just kind of vaguely know they're out there. But you know that there is an authority figure or an authority that has power in both places at once. It's not just local anymore, right? In this case, it would be like the genius of the emperor, right? Wow, okay, the emperor's power must be everywhere because even though neither of us here in Libya or over there in Gaul are in his locality, his power is here, right? So that's what the, the theme of all the different universal gods that we met are everything gods that we met, that that's the theme of them is they come with these political units called empires, right? Once you have people who have power in lots of places, you have gods who have powers in lots of places. Got it? All right, cool. Thank you very much. Um, let's pick up where we left off from last time um, with this notion of, of our strange hermeneutics, meaning our ways of interpreting whatever we're interpreting, in this case, ancient pagan cultures. Okay. Uh, I talked before, I gave you sort of the example of uh, we as modern people are particularly bad at looking at ancient mythologies because we generally see them through our own lenses, right? Everyone does that, right? Everyone assumes their own hermeneutics are just normal the way humans think, right? That's not true, that's, that's never true. What's true is you think and process information based on your culture, your background, whatever, right? Wherever you've learned your things from, and so, since we are a particularly science-based culture, when we look at an ancient myth, we assume, oh, well, it's not the way we talk and think now, so it has to be some sort of imperfect version of science, the way we think, right? And so it leads us to reading ancient myths and going, oh, this is the way they thought the world worked. But that's not true, right? That's a bad hermeneutic, right? It is factually correct that these stories contain proto-science in them, but that's not what they're made to do, okay? That's not their function. 
So I gave you the example of, you know, saying myth is bad science is like saying ballet is an inefficient way of walking across a room. That's factually correct, but it's really weird hermeneutics, and it's definitely not going to help you understand what ballet is. Right? It's factually correct, but it, it will mislead you. Okay. So we are now about halfway through the course, give or take. We're about one day short of halfway through the course. And so let's continue on this discussion with hermeneutics a little bit more. I would like um, us to sort of turn in on ourselves a little bit, try to figure out how our own hermeneutics work. Now, that's easier said than done. <laughs> no one really fully understands their own point of view, right? You can't really, it's really difficult to point out water to a fish, right? How do I tell someone this is how you see the world? You're trying to explain to someone that they have a bias or a bigotry about something, and they don't think they do, and they clearly do, right? You can't explain it because you're trying to tell someone about something from another point of view, another interpretation that they themselves don't have. And so they think that what they're doing is normal or whatever. And honest, uh, you know, honest truth is, as far as hermeneutics go, there's no such thing as a normal way of interpreting things, right? There's just one way versus another way, a more useful way versus a less useful way, right? Now, so how are we going to find your hermeneutic? Well, chances are most of us have a vaguely similar hermeneutic about certain ideas and thoughts that we've all inherited together as a culture. Um, if you're in this room right now, we're all, we're all speaking English, we're all living in North America. So whether, wherever you are personally from, we at least have that thing in common, that sort of shared hermeneutic of, we understand how people in North America who speak English talk and how they use ideas. Okay. The one we've been talking about in this classroom is about this magical word called religion. Right. So it's, a, it's a modern word. It is not sui generis. It's not a naturally occurring way of thinking about the world. It's a modern Western Christian way of thinking about the world that, because of colonialism, got exported to everyone everywhere. Now it seems to be universal and normal, but it's just one way one culture thinks versus some other culture thinking some other way. When I ask you guys, and we've been doing this all semester, and I haven't said anything about it yet, how often you guys, when I've asked you what something means or what you see when we look at a, de a text or a, piece, or a piece of art, how often still the word belief comes out of your mouths? I bet you most of are still thinking religion equals belief, right? Because that's the hermeneutic of this culture, that not only does this thing called religion exist, but it's defined by your personal beliefs of something. Okay, so far so good. That is your hermeneutic. It's really powerful, you can't just turn it off, right? The way you've been taught to see the world is not just a, a switch, you know, boop, I don't wanna think like that anymore, I wanna see what objectively the world is like. It doesn't work that way. Instead, all you can do is, all right, I've been told from childhood that there's a thing called religion, and it's all about your personal belief systems. Except that is demonstrably factually not universal. We all think that way because we're in this culture here now that is not typical of the way humans themselves think at all times and places. It's not even the standard. It's just one way amongst lots of others. So, to help you understand your own hermeneutics better, I'm going to take us. We're going to take a quick look at how paganism affects our lives. Um, but specifically in the context of what happens when you talk about your own culture as belief system. Okay. We've been seeing, we've looked at Taoism, Confucianism, um, Hinduism, Buddhism, and now on to paganism. And you guys have said the word belief a lot in this class. I don't know if you know this, but I haven't said it that much, right? So the reason why is because belief as a category just means thought, right? Everyone can talk about any worldview, anything you do is about your beliefs, right? Why are you sitting there? Because I believe in going to college, right? It's true, it's kind of lame, but it's, it's a bad hermeneutic, but it is true, right? So, okay, what happens when you apply this hermeneutic to yourself? Okay. When you look at our culture and talk about it the way we talk about religion, right? And of course, things start to behave oddly. Now, we also mentioned that these ancient people, generally speaking, did not think of themselves as pagans. Pagan, right? It's an insult that means a redneck or a hick, paganus, right? Um, it's related to the word peasant. It means an idiot. So obviously, they didn't call themselves that. So right now, we're trying, to get rid of, get, we're trying to get past that hermeneutical barrier we're having 
where we're thinking they're pagans, but what are they thinking of themselves? And we don't have those thoughts in our head because they're not us, right? So how do we flip it? Use the way we talk about them to talk about ourselves. And what you really, what quickly happens is if that's true, and these ancient people who don't have a word like paganism for themselves, and who don't normally think of themselves as having a religion, and who don't normally think of themselves as doing everything about their belief systems, well, once you get that out of the way, it means that paganism isn't dead. It's still here. All of the, the ways that people celebrate paganism in the ancient world, we still have some variation of them today in this culture here now, right? What are these guys? They seem to be dressed up as leprechauns. Okay, um, so let's contextualize that a little bit first. Uh, first, they're dressed up, okay? They don't normally dress this way. Goodness, goodness, I hope not. Next up, what's a leprechaun? Come on, you all know. What is it? A creature from folklore. What's its nature? What does it do? Yeah? According to some beliefs, it's... Uh, uh, <laughs> From schools of thought, it's a cheater fairy, oh. <laughs> quote unquote fairy, uh -huh. that has a pot of gold. Uh -huh. According to some specific schools of thought, it can be either mis mischievous, malicious, or benevolent. You mean a god? It's naturally <laughs> occurring supernatural being that guards rainbows and gold. Delicious, nice, has power over you. Depending on this. I mean, they are literally yeah. ancient Celtic gods, right? They're place gods, they're local gods. Right? That's who they are. Why are these people dressed as them? Yeah? To celebrate their heritage. To celebrate their heritage, yes, by dressing up like gods that they clearly believe in. Do these people believe leprechauns exist? Presumably not. But they're dressed up like them for some reason. <laughs> What's the reason? For St. Patrick's Day, the great pagan holiday of St. Patrick's Day. Who's St. Patrick? Oh, third century Roman, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a little older than, I mean, so uh, he was a Roman citizen from what we now call England. Um, he got kidnapped and brought to Ireland as a slave. His name was Patricius, he was a Roman citizen. Um, and he brought, amongst other people, he, would, he was a Christian, so he brought Christianity with him. And then he, when he came, later he escaped on a pirate strip ship and came back to England, and that's where he ended up dying. And so he's a credit of bringing Christianity specifically to Ireland, okay? And so we celebrate that by getting very, very drunk on the holiday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mockery. <laughs> well, not really. All right. Exactly. It's just Latin for making something holy. All right. Why? First off, when is this holiday? When is this the date that these guys are doing this right now? What's the date of it? What's the date of Patrick's Day? Yes. March 17th. March 17th. Cool. Why are they wearing all green? Yeah. You don't wear green on why do you believe that's true? <laughs> oh, okay, so it must be true. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Your experience has told you. Why green? Yeah? It's a tradition, but why is it a tradition? And traditions have points of origin, right? Yeah? The Irish flag. Why is the Irish flag got green on it? Why is Ireland the Emerald Isle? The land is green. And March 17th, mid March, the land is green. Yeah, it's green. It's a spring festival. That's why there's leprechauns there. That's why there's rainbows for, for the springtime rain that brings green grass, right? This is an old pagan ritual that's been Christianized, right? Now, if you try to explain this through a belief system, whether those are Christian beliefs or, for that matter, anyone's beliefs, it makes absolutely no sense. These people are dressed up like leprechauns. 
They don't believe leprechauns exist, though. Um, and they're doing it to celebrate St. Patrick, who I'm going to take a serious bet that they don't know who that really is. And if they did, they might be too drunk to remember right now. <laughs> is that all correct? So why are they doing this? By the way, this is presumably at a parade, right? We learned about parades a moment ago. Why? Why do you do this? This place is fun. It's fun. Hooray. Yes. It is definitely fun to stand outside in the winter and get very drunk and wear ridiculous clothes. <laughs> right? Yes, it is. Okay. Interesting. Let's go on. Any other uh, annual festivals anyone been going to recently? Yes, please. Halloween. Halloween? What's Halloween? I know it's pagan, specifically. Oh, see, this is the problem is everything's pagan. Everything that's um, pagan. They would, they would make sacrifices um, to, I don't know, the, the reason like we have trick or treating is because like the god would come to your door and like give me give them your sacrifice. Would the children who are trick or treating know that? You go trick or treating, and someone says, "Why are you knocking on my door and asking for candy?" Because the gods, <laughs> because of my belief system, <laughs> representative of the gods, uh, and we just happen to be doing this on the day that's exactly directly in the middle of the summer solstice and the winter solstice, October thirty-first. It's a weird coincidence. How about this one here? What is that? I have no idea. What is it? State Fair. This is the Iowa State Fair. Right? Cool. What are you celebrating? Yes, please. Uh, in Minnesota, a lot of it's like harvest. Like it's, it's, like, it's like farmers bring stuff. It's very much like eating gluttony. It's the harvest festival. <laughs> Late summer. You eat ridiculous foods, deliberately ridiculous foods, right? Cool. How many of you went to the State Fair this year alone? How many went to the State Fair? Like half of you. Cool. How many of you before now, if I'm going to ask you, did you celebrate the Harvest Festival this year? Would you go, yep. This is what you did. Why don't we call it that? Yeah. It's not very profitable to say a Harvest Festival. <laughs> So it's in our, in our sort of late capitalist mindsets, whatever, right? we want to reframe it as we're celebrating Iowa. What, why are we celebrating Iowa at the harvest, right? What does it tell you about the people of Iowa? What does it tell you about their belief systems? You're going to go to this special place once a year, deliberately ingest foods that are going to make you sick, and you know that they're going to make you sick, right? You all know it. You do it anyway to celebrate something. Iowa, I guess. Right? It's the Harvest Festival, right? It's celebrating the plenty of the harvest that's happening, right? It would be happening right then if you were in the agriculture world. Right? Again, if you describe it as a belief system, right, as, well, because they believe in a harvest festival on the day, that's, this is not about a belief system, right? It's just tradition. It's what you do. The, the reasoning behind it is of no consequence. The fact that it happens to be a harvest festival, and that's why there's tons of animals and plants and food everywhere, Fertility gods, anyone? But because we don't believe that that's true, you know, that's just incidental. It happens to be a, uh, an old harvest festival. Um, back to the getting drunk part. The old mystery cult of Eleusis, bless you, and its later replacement, the Christian cult of Jesus, um, has to deliberately ingest a liquid substance that's going to change your mental dispositions as part of its religious sacraments. Now, obviously you guys are, none of you are drinkers, obviously, and none of you are old enough to drink or know, or know a guy who can get some. And none of you would go to the state fair or anywhere else like that and then consume alcohol because that would be wicked. Uh, but if you were such wicked people and you were consuming this alcohol in a public setting, what would be the, the rules for how you can drink alcohol in public? Or in private, for that matter. How about 
So here's the Iowa Craft Beer Tent at the State Fair. Could you drink a beer right now? Even if, it's, even if you're, let's say, imagine you're all of age and you all drink. Could you, could you drink a beer right now? Yes. Yes, you can. Why are none of you drinking a beer right now? Is the beer delicious? Why aren't you drinking it now? Because it alters your so does coffee. Yes, please. Social norms and standards. Oh, so there's something social about it? Is there a difference between drinking alone and drinking with a friend? And is there a difference between drinking alone and drinking with a friend and drinking with 20 friends? And how about when can you drink? Not now, but if you wait three hours, no one's going to care. If you drank a beer here, someone would care. If you waited in this classroom for the after five o'clock and you guys snuck in here and had a beer, I mean, granted, I'd probably call the cops on all of you, but, <laughs> but, I would. Um, <laughs> uh, but, it would be somehow better, more acceptable, right? Getting drunk in this situation is somehow better than getting drunk in other situations, right? That's why on St. Patrick's Day, you can drink at 9 a.m. and no one questions that, but if you did the day before or after St. Patrick's Day, you probably need to get a Right? Okay. Because if you're drinking green beer 9 a.m. on a regular days, that's a problem. That's not a judge, of course. So you want to alter your mental state, but you can do that at any time. But we look down upon people who do it whenever they can. So there's certain times and places in which you can do this ritualistically. Yes? We look down on a lot of college kids if we do, and this, but then, and then also, but, uh, and yet, well, no, I can't say this in public. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, it never stopped any college kids from ever doing it before. Because it's been excused. Why is it excused even though we shame it? If I went to, like, I'm 42 years old. If I went to a kegger, I would not tell anyone about it. You guys, probably most of you have been to a kegger in the last year, and if you haven't been, you probably will be. Why is it different? Yeah? Yeah. It's like a rite of passage almost, considered? It's, it's a rite of passage. It's a, yeah, a very large, huge thing of beer. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a rite of passage. It's stupidity is actually kind of part of the rite of passage, too, right? Like, getting drunk with a bunch of frat guys in college is like kind of what college students do, even though college students themselves think it's stupid. Right? Does that reflect your belief system? You know it's stupid, right? But we're all going to do it. Because it's fine, right? Huh. You guys ever seen the Apis Bowl? What are we looking at here? What is it? The butter cow. The butter cow. What's the butter cow? Yes, please. It's a Midwestern idol. It is a Midwestern <laughs> idol. Great. Explain. Tell me about the belief systems of the people who produce this idol. Uh, it's the people that produce this highly value agriculture. Specifically, what about agriculture? Um, butter and cows. Butter and cows. Where does butter come from? The cow. Okay. <laughs> By the way, it's never a butter bowl. Butter cow. This is a dairy product, right? It is a cow made out of cow. We laugh, but you know it's true. I, I'm not giving you any new information, right? Why is it weird to talk about it as an idol? That people can go and take a picture of it, or in this case, have me take a picture of this lady taking a picture of it. Because we're used to viewing idols as like this big grand thing, whereas with the butter cow, we just view it as this cool, awesome, funny thing. If there was no pane of glass there, would you feel comfortable like breaking it? What would happen if you broke it in the middle of the Iowa State Fair? What would happen to you? <laughs> at best, at best, you'd be arrested. It would probably not be the best situation. Probably be beaten to death by a crowd. <laughs> Could you imagine? 
we, we do not mock the gods. <laughs> okay, we've realized it's female. It is a dairy product made out of dairy product. Yeah? Is she a fertility <laughs> goddess? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know, maybe she's a herald of the god Kata. I don't know, but she could be a fertility goddess, right? Why on earth, it looks the same as last year. Why are you gonna go again? How many people have seen it more than once in their life? About half the class again. Why? It looked the same as last time, and it'll look the same next time, too. It's fair, I haven't seen it since I've been in Texas most of my life. Alright, well then you need to get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's to celebrate the success of Iowa in a very abstract way. Right? The, the, the level of hoopty I jumped to, to explain how this is a belief system, it works. It actually does make perfect sense. It's agriculture, dairy, it's a representation of that during the harvest. People take pilgrimages to go see it, right? Yes. Okay. you've never seen the butter cow. Is right. it the same butter cow every year? No, they make a new one every year. So it's, is it slightly different or is it roughly the same? It's, 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 the, the cow itself is always exactly the same. Okay. I mean, they do it by hand, so I don't know. It, it's roughly the same size and dimension. Right? It has to be hollow. <coughs> is it hollow? I don't think it's hollow. I don't think it's hollow. I don't think, I don't think, it's hollow. I don't think it would be hollow. Like, if the legs are made out of butter, how would it be? Is that time for some sort of structure? Yeah, there's probably some sort of wire or something in there. Plus, it is in a refrigerated case, so it could be rock hard. That's why it's behind glass. Do you know the answer to this? I don't know. They reuse the butter? Oh my god! I love rituals! <laughs> oh, it is frozen. Okay. I know it's refrigerated because if, if you touch the glass, the glass is super cold. Um, yeah, okay. So, so we take this, so we have butter that we're not going to eat, that we're specifically have no intention of eating, and we're going to reuse it to reannually make a female representation of a maternal figure that creates dairy, because she's maternal, and the dairy creates the butter, which creates the cow. This, this could totally be a story from ancient Babylon, <laughs> right? Because if you explain it this way, it sounds nuts. When you're no, this is what we do. It's culture, tradition, it's heritage, right? And that's fine. It's, that's correct. If I were to come into you and try to give you that explanation of what the butter cow is, you know, I mean, that's technically right, but that's really weird, right? <laughs> when you say things like ancient people have beliefs when they talk about their gods and stuff like that, that's what you're doing. It's not wrong, but those are, that's your hermeneutic talking, not theirs. You see the difference? Yes, please. If somebody, like, if you look at the UAP, somebody said that they did this in, like, uh, I don't know, Iraq. Yeah. And that they, like, and they didn't have, like, an Iowa festival either. It was, like, an Iraq festival. And they said that they they make a cow with butter and they go and they, they, they take pictures with it. And we think it's, like, really weird. Yeah. 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 If I asked you without this picture here, did you ever visit the Apis Bull? Did you ever go to Egypt on pilgrimage to see a fertility bull? It's like, no. But you go down to Des Moines to see a fertility cow made out of butter. Right? It, it, it's so weird that once you pull yourself out of it, you realize, okay, I have a hermeneutic that tells me this is normal, this is not normal. Or this is just what we do, that's a belief system. Uh oh. <laughs> Someone look up what the word mascot means. What's a mascot? Yes, please. A symbolic form that's made to represent a certain event or people or good luck. Is there an etymology of the word mascot at the bottom of that definition? What's the origin of it? Yeah. Which 
which means, someone have the etymology of it up? What does the word mascot mean? And what is it, where does it come from? The idea of a mascot. I heard something, you got to Provençal, which is, you know, pretty modern French. Someone? Speed, look it up. Mascot, I would think, which means lucky charm. Lucky charm. Do you believe this is lucky? Is this lucky? Is this magic? It warps the laws of causality so that luck becomes better for you? This is a person in a suit, right? No. <gasps> Wait, is it? Uh oh. How about this one? This thing has a name, right? What's its name? Psy. Uh, Psy. Torture Cyclone. That's Psy, right? Don't yell at me. I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Is Psy real? Do you believe in Psy? Yeah. Let me answer your question with a question. No. <laughs> Our idea is real. Yeah, our idea is real. I don't know, I'm asking you. Let me ask you, let me answer a question. Let me answer a question with a question with a question. <laughs> you understand, so this is what we call a permanent or feedback loop, right? Which is that if you're changing the rules and definition, you never get anywhere. But this is our problem, right? Because the way we talk about this stuff, if it was any other culture, you guys would immediately be calling it a belief system. It sounds really weird to focus it that way, though, right? How about this? Uh, does Psy pass through time? Does Psy get older? <laughs> Uh-oh. You mean Psy's a god? He has power over you, right? Wait, hold on. If you guys go to a game and Psy is up there and he does this, what do you do? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, he's definitely a god, right? It's a, it's, it's a giant animated bird with suspiciously blue eyes that can make you do things that you wouldn't normally do. And he doesn't age. Yeah. He's also everywhere on campus and around angels. Yes! Oh, that's... Hold on. He's a local guy. He's not an everywhere guy. His powers are not everywhere, right? How about this one? Uh, the colors. I said about, about 15 of you I think I caught have some version of size colors on right now. Great. Uh, hi guys back there, hey. Um, <laughs> are the colors arbitrary? Could the school change its colors? Right, they can school change its colors. They're copyrighted colors. Maybe they'll be a copyright suit and then change the color for some reason. And we'll have to change the colors from like crimson and gold to like, I don't know, green and gold. Or blue and gold or whatever, right? That, I mean, look, I know that might be annoying because you get all new stuff, but at the end of the day, you'd be fine, right? So we could change it to like blue and gold. Or black and gold? Uh-oh. Wait, what was that? <laughs> Why don't we talk about that one? The colors don't mean anything, right? Why can't our colors be black and gold? Which is another magical bird. Um, <laughs> another locality, another place, right? That's their god's colors, not ours. Our flying god is not like their flying god at all. <laughs> Yeah. So couldn't you technically like use the Iowa State football game as like a religious war? <laughs> An idol is actually related to the word idea. An idol is a, a mental projection of a god. An icon, you said a sports icon. What's an icon? Those of you who go to churches. What's an icon? What's iconography? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a representation of Jesus, Mary, or a saint, right? It's a representation of the transcendent, the divine, in material form, right? And that's what we call our sports figures. Once again, any other culture, if we were studying this in the class, this would be called a totem, right? And there are weird rules about it, that even though you've probably never held this exact object in your hands, can you put it on the floor? Right? You will treat it with reverence. It's a holy object. Oh, no, it's not holy, right? We're just going to treat it with it. Right. But we don't believe that. If you did it, we treat it religiously. 
If we win, we believe it. If we have the experience of it, then it's real. If you steal it, it's not real. Right? Then it's just a piece of crap. Right? What on earth is this? <laughs> what are we looking at here? Yes, please? Is it what? Uh, probably. <laughs> yes, please, way back there. That is Lady Gaga. Is that her name? No. Do you know that that's not her name? We all know that's not her name. She was not born the Lady Gaga to Mr. and Mrs. Gaga. <laughs> By the way, lady is the feminine form of lord, so she's the goddess Gaga. Um, why is she called by a name that's not her name, and we all know that's not really her name? Why do we have bands with names? Why don't we, when you go to see a, a musical performance, why don't you just call them by their names? Her name is Stephanie. Why do we play this game? We don't really think these are their names, right? <coughs> yes, please. And why do you think it sounds cooler? Because we don't hear it every day, like all the time. It makes them stand out and apart and different. Uh oh. Yes, please. Also, the name is different than why between the actual person and the stage exists. Are you talking about the sacred and the profane? Do you guys believe that she can fly? Because look, she's flying. She <laughs> The way she's dressed, the way she's presenting herself, I mean, she's a particularly over-the-top example of this, but why don't musicians wear normal clothes? They're singers, they're not there to be looked at, right? They're there for sound. How about this one? What would you rather do? You can either spend $20 and have her latest album, perfect audio quality, made in, made in a studio by the best musicians in the world, the best sound techs in the world, it is perfect recording, or you can go see her do it live, and it'll be deeply imperfect. Which would you rather do? You'd rather go to the show, right? Yeah. Where you're going to probably wear unusual clothes, you're going to be social, you're probably going to go with friends, you're not going to probably go by yourself, you're probably going to drink, or not, right? or techie on, right? <laughs> to go see a less perfect version of the artist. Again. If you start to explain all these things as belief systems, the way we talk about other cultures, it sounds freaking nuts. <laughs> but we do it, we go, well, yeah, I mean, that's technically true. We know that's not really her name. We know she can't really fly. We know that like, she doesn't, the way she's dressed is a costume, right? We know it's a game, but it's a really real game, right? It's a game that we know the rules for. We don't talk about that we know the rules for it, but we all do, right? You don't walk up and punch the mascot to your own school. Other mascots, that's acceptable, right? You don't take a bite out of the butter cow, because you'll die a terrible death, right? Welcome to half before the semester. The reason why we're having this discussion now and not before. One, I wanted to guys, give you guys enough to work with as far as like religious data to anthropologize what we're looking at here. So, good, thank you, you did that well. Um, next thing though, is that your hermeneutics, your personal hermeneutics, or cultural hermeneutics, are about to kick on way more powerfully for most of us than they have previously in this class. Because we're about to get to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Where, whatever you may or may not know about Taoism, I'm sure for most of you, for 95% of you, it pales in comparison to what you know about Christianity or Judaism or Islam. You have all sorts of preconceived notions about those ones. Good and bad, right? There's tons of data in your head about those traditions, okay? And so we have to learn what we're doing. We have to see that you have a hermeneutic too. You have a disposition. You've been told things about this before. When you read the Bible or the Quran, whether you know it or not, there are voices whispering in your ear saying, look at that, don't look at that. This is a belief system, that is not. Right. Okay? Remember, we're not meeting on Monday, but everyone have a lovely weekend and get out. Voices.